Hello, everybody, and welcome to Church at Home with Rachel for Thursday. No idea what day it is, just Thursday. <laughs> Glad to see you. Something, I've been spending a lot of time on the road and a lot of time listening to the radio lately, and one of the big things, of course, is the Gaza, Israel, like the Palestinian, um, what's happening in Palestine and Israel. And lots of conversation about universities and the colleges and the states and now across Canada as well, some um, students protesting. And my husband and I have had some heated conversations about about that, about what that's, what that's about. And um, so how for some people it seems absolutely ridiculous, you know, these young people, why are they protesting? This is a waste of money. They're just being ridiculous. Instead of spending time in school, they're, they're protesting something. And I think there's something to be said for this. I'm not coming down on one side or other or the other of the protesting. What I'm suggesting is that our young people are a good barometer. These are people who, regardless of what you think of, of university education, part of what university education is about is critical thinking. I remember when I went off to university way back a thousand years ago, I, w I graduated high school. I'd done pretty well, not well enough to get scholarships, but well enough to get into university. And I got to my first year and I was caught up short. I didn't know how to think. I knew, knew how to regurgitate. I knew how to, to memorize inf information and feed it back on a pa in a paper or on a test. But I really struggled with writing those essays that, you know, compare and contrast, especially when the question wasn't black and white. When I was asked to give some, my thoughts on something like James Joyce and the portrait of the artist as a young man or um, Oliver Twist or Bleak House or Shakespeare, there's all kinds of information in there that I could have just spouted back. But I wasn't being asked to give what someone else thought. I was asked to study it to research it, to discover what other people thought, and on top of that, not simply plagiarize what other people thought, but come up with my own arguments, my own ideas of where does this make me go? What does this make me think of? What are the implications for the world? Sort of like preparing for a sermon, although then I didn't have a clue I'd be doing that every week. The idea being that when I prepare for a sermon, I don't simply just sit down, read the gospel, and then quote back what was in the gospel. That would be ridiculous. I also don't simply sit down with commentaries and figure out what every other person has said about the gospel and share that with everyone. I have to think about it and I pray about it and I wonder, how does this impact my life? How does it change my life? Should it change my life? Should I be changing because of what I'm reading and what I'm sharing? And generally with sermons, yes, the answer is, yeah, you should be changing your life because we're not there yet. We just aren't the people we're, we're, we're called to be yet. We don't have all the answers. And that requires questions. And it requires reflection and thinking and contemplating and, and pondering and all of these ings that make us uncomfortable. And that's really what university is for in many ways. It's about going into a new situation in which you're treated as an adult and then you're told to think like an adult. Don't simply take what, the, what your professor has to say, like pablum. Don't simply hear or read a textbook and say, well, it's obviously right because it was published and there, therefore I don't have to think about it. The whole point is to think about it. I, can't, I think it's the Socratic method that when Socrates was asking, was trying to teach, he asked questions. If you answered this, then he'd say, what about that? And what about this? And what about that? It's annoying, isn't it? You think you've gotten there and then there's another question. But the fact is that if we start, if we stop questioning, if we simply accept what's been given to us, we will never learn anything. And that's exactly what the universities, what university education is all about. And for a long, long time, college education was like the blue collar stuff, the, the practical hands on, even the computer stuff, the stuff that would be giving you, you're going to learn how to do something that you can go out into the world and do. And university, a lot of people make fun of that. University, you're going to go there and you're going to party and you're going to think all the time or not. Well, the fact is that for those of you who've never tried a university course, before you mock it, try it. It is not easy. Same as if I went to a college court campus and tried to learn how to do mechanics or nursing or, you know, architecture or, you know, landscape design. I don't know how to do that. 
It's hard work. There is not a higher a, a, a level of higher education that is easy for 99% of us anyway. And university is is exactly like that. It's it's not easy. And part of it is is because it's not formatted. It's not here. This is what you must learn in order to do X, Y, and Z. My university education taught me how to think critically, how to read something and not just accept that it's true because somebody wrote it down on paper. Even scripture. There are parts of scripture that I remember my professor, Gord Hamilton, would watch. We would read it in the Old Testament and he would read it out loud and he'd watch me to see how I'd react because I think he thought I had like, I had a, a, a little kid's idea of theology that if I read something challenging, it's going to shock my, like, going to blow up my brain. And the fact is it didn't because I was trained in my undergrad in English language and literature to read something and allow it to do, do some work and allow myself to argue with it. Allow myself to be uncomfortable with it and say, I don't know about that. I don't agree with what that professor said. I don't agree with what that textbook writer wrote. But then the next step of not agreeing was to prove it. To do the work, to do the research, to read it again, to write my own stuff, to say, this is why I think this is wrong and this is why I think this is right. This is my proposal. And that's an important thing. And university students who are, who are protesting for the most part, I'm not suggesting that every university student is protesting is with right reasons. And there are lots of people apparently who are joining in on the protests who aren't even members of universities and colleges. But those students who are truly upset and concerned about what's happening in the world, there's a reason. What's happening in Israel and Palestine in Gaza is not simply, it's not simple. It is not about people hating Jews. It is not about people hating Palestinians. It is not simply about the scriptures say, some scriptures say that the world cannot come to its fruition and Jesus can't come back again until Israel is in control of Jerusalem. There are many ways to understand scripture. There are many ways to understand the different kinds of scripture, the different holy books. There are ways of understanding who Jesus is and what he said and what he did not say. And there are also things to be considered, especially when I think about what we are grappling with in, in Canada and within the Anglican Church of Canada, in my own diocese, around colonization and the, the, the residential schools and the white papers, where we came here with this doctrine of discovery that said, we discovered the land, so it is ours. We will make of it what we want. And those... Um, pesky little people who were here already, well, we'll just ignore them. We'll just kick them out. We'll put them on reserves. We'll starve them to death. We'll poison them with, with smallpox. We'll do things. We'll put them down. We'll make it difficult for them to vote, make it difficult for them to go get an education so that they can learn something and challenge us in our own courts. And while the world stood by and watched what was happening in, in, in Germany and in Eastern Euro in Europe with for the Jews who are being removed from their home, from their lands, from the places they called home. And they were denied other places, other countries were refusing to take them. I get it that they wanted to create a place where the, the Jewish people would have a place to call their own, to have Israel. I understand that. But I also understand that the place that they determined would be Israel was already a home for the people of Palestine, some of whom were Jewish. Some were Muslims, some were Christians, some were nothing, but they were people and they found themselves displaced. They found themselves at war, a war that's never ended. In 70 years, a war that has never ended. The students who are protesting, the students who are, pro the students who are protesting that, that, that about anti-Semitism, that they're saying that they're being treated with anti-Semitism, that the people are hating on the Jews. They have a reason for believing that because of what people or some people are saying. And the people who are saying that they have to stand up for the Palestinians, they have to stand up for Gaza, that's wrong what's happening to Palestinians, they have a point as well. And that is the beauty of the nature of university. Is that two different groups with two completely different perspectives have been given the skills and the tools and the ability to sit down across from each other and say to one another, you, if I honestly listen to you, 
and you want us to listen to me. Together we might find that common ground. Together we might find a new way. We might problem solve. There is a long history of young people growing up to be problem solvers. I don't know of any prime minister or president of the United States, prime minister of Canada, president of the United States, who didn't have a university education. I might be wrong, but they were educated. And that didn't mean that when they were students, they were brilliant and they had it all figured out. But what it meant was that they learned how to work with others to figure it out. And that's what we need today. We need to not penalize our students for having one opinion or another. We need to not rile them up and fire them up and, and tell them that they are not being listened to or tell them that they are wrong. We need to tone it down and allow them to have opportunities and venues and people who will listen so that they might do at a younger age what they will do at an older age. They will problem solve. They will figure out how to fix these messes we're in. And eventually one day there will be peace. And it will come because somebody, when they were a young person, said, this is not okay. We need to encourage our young people to speak, to protest, to be able to think critically and say enough is enough, something has to give. But then we have to give them space to do that. And we have to do it in a way that will be helpful and not hurtful. So I get that lots of people are going to disagree with me about this. Lots of people are, are, are going to think I'm crazy. But as one who's university educated and recognizes that most of my ability to do what I do today comes from my seven years in university. I can't throw the university out with the bathwater. May the protesters protest peacefully because in peaceful protest will come ears that are willing to listen. God bless. Have a great day and I'll see you again tomorrow for Church at Home with Rachel.